upon the field of battle, La Grande Armée arrested. Bivouacs were established where, just hours before, vicious melees had raged and cannons boomed. Bodies still littered the field. The groans of the wounded and dying echoed in still night air. For Emperor Napoleon, the day of October 14th had been a trying one. Under his personal direction, an entire Prussian army under the Prince of Hernle had been routed at Jena. Only miles away at Auerstedt, Marshal Nicolas Davout had fought to a standstill an even larger Prussian army under the personal command of the Duke of Brunswick, who himself had died in the fighting. 170,000 Prussian soldiers had set out for the occupation of Saxony only a few weeks ago. Now a third were lost as casualties and prisoners, and the rest were in full retreat. However, from his headquarters at Jena, Napoleon was not yet to know the full scale of the Prussian defeat. Hernler's army was utterly broken, but the late Brunswick's army was largely intact. What's more, a third force, an uncommitted reserve of Prussian troops, 13,000 soldiers under the Duke of Württemberg, was lingering in the vicinity of Halle. So though the Prussians were beaten, they were not yet broken. Erring on the side of caution, Napoleon therefore only permitted the light cavalry of Joachim Marat's division to carry out a pursuit. Hussars and dragoons streamed west towards Weimar, pursuing the shattered remnants of Hernlo's army. The rest of the French army was only given a general order to pursue on the morning of October 15th, having taken the night to rest and resupply. The three most heavily engaged corps under Marshal Jean Lannes, Pierre Augereau and Nicolas Davout were still, even after this reprieve, in no condition to force march. The slack was taken up by the relatively unengaged corps of Jean Soul, Michel Ney, and most notably Jean-Baptiste Bernadotte. Bernadotte's performance on the 14th had been poor. Marching between two battles, he'd failed to participate in either, leaving Davout out to dry and Napoleon deeply disappointed. Vain and catty, but brave in equal measure, Bernadotte was eager to restore his reputation. Marching from a polder 17 miles north towards Halle, his corps caught the Duke of Württemberg as he was making ready to withdraw. The battle was brief and wholly lopsided. For 800 casualties, Bernadotte destroyed over half of Württemberg's reserve. Not long after the Battle of Halle, Marat had reached Erfurt, taking as many as 14,000 prisoners, among them the Prince of Orange and General Merlendorf. This left intact only the main force retreating from Auerstedt. Sul and Ney were on their trail, force marching north along the Elbe. Order had almost completely broken down in the Prussian army and in the haste of their retreat, they abandoned essentially all of their food, munitions, and other supplies. As Sul and Ney raced by, they found stocked wagons rolled into ditches by the roadside. So between the night's delay imposed by Napoleon and a freshly unencumbered retreat, the Prussian army was able to make good its escape. On October 17th, the remaining French corps joined the pursuit. Napoleon wasn't far behind, relocating himself and the Imperial Guard to Weimar. Thousands of Prussian prisoners were still being processed as Napoleon made the city palace, the Schloss Weimar, his new headquarters. The irony was palpable. Only a few days before, the King and Queen of Prussia had resided here, chiding on their generals and advisers to destroy the French interlopers. And where were they now? Queen Louise had fled Weimar in a panic, Marat's hussars at her heels. King Friedrich Wilhelm instead had stayed with the main Prussian army and when the Duke of Brunswick caught a bullet to the face, assumed command just in time to put his name to the fiasco at Auerstedt. He was now with that army fleeing north back into the Prussian heartland of Brandenburg. But even this miraculous escape was not fast enough. By October 18th, the French pursuit was barreling up the Elbe like a tidal wave. Rather than take command of the defence, the king ran, abandoning the army. The departure of the incompetent king was an immediate improvement for the Prussians, not that it really mattered. The Prince of Hernle was now in overall command. He aimed to fight some rearguard actions to thwart an easy French crossing of the Elbe. Ideally, this would buy some time until some sort of reserve could be rallied in Brandenburg. That was the plan anyway. In practice, the Prussians parted like palm fronds. At Wittenberg on October 22nd, the Saxon populace gladly aided the advance of the Vu's corps by disarming mines left behind on the town's bridge by a Prussian rearguard. His plan in shambles, Hernler had to abandon the Elbe defence, 
and therefore leave Brandenburg and Berlin open to Napoleon. It was forced instead to make for the Pomeranian coast, following the Oder River past Berlin and up to Stettin. Grumpy Gerhard von Blücher was given a portion of Hernler's army, in order to strike out for East Prussia in the vain hope that he could join any Russian army that might intervene. Blücher certainly gave it everything he had, but his force was weighed down by all of the Prussian artillery Hernler had offloaded in his panic. There was no way to make it east. So instead, Blücher went west to Brunswick. Again, the artillery bogged him down. Sul, Ney and Marat were rapidly converging on Magdeburg. Blücher was only spared encirclement by the city's formidable defences, which delayed the French. His hope now was to join a 9,000-strong Swedish army assembled at Strasslund. Marat's cavalry, followed by Bernadotte, was not far behind, though. Cut to ribbons by French hussars on the roads, Blücher's force abandoned what little they still carried, and in scattered bands evaded marauding French patrols. Most of the survivors regrouped in Lübeck, while a fortunate few did manage to make it to Strasland. With all military options for arresting French momentum now exhausted, the time had clearly come for Prussia to throw in the towel. The first peace offering arrived on Napoleon's desk at Weimar on the 19th. It came directly from Friedrich Wilhelm and offered terms for an armistice before a conditional peace. Napoleon read the appeal and decided it didn't even deserve a response, it was so out of touch. The next day, Prussian ambassador to France, Giolamo Lucassini, presented himself to Napoleon and offered terms. Aware that Lucassini was one of the prime players in the Prussian war faction that had convinced Friedrich Wilhelm to invade Saxony and wage war on France, Napoleon again rejected this peace offering. Instead, as was his habit in tense peace negotiations like this, Napoleon substituted his own offer. In this case, unconditional Prussian surrender. A vague outline of a post-war settlement was also drawn up by Napoleon, in which Prussia would lose her Westphalian provinces and enter into an alliance with France against Russia. Lucassini obligingly returned these terms to Friedrich Wilhelm, who was by now back in Berlin and on the verge of fleeing again for East Prussia. More concerned about a counter-alliance against Russia than losing land, the king was not prepared to accept right away. He was under the mistaken impression that Hernler's line on the Elbe had not yet been broken, and that there was still hope of salvaging the military situation. But as the Elbe line sundered, Friedrich Wilhelm did accept the inevitable. He conveyed his acceptance to Napoleon on October 30th, only to receive a rather quick response, a resounding no. By then, the French advance had completely outpaced negotiations. On the evening of the 24th, French troops overran the cities of Potsdam, Köln and Spandau, today all suburbs of Berlin, but in the early 1800s still separate cities. Potsdam itself was the beating heart of the Hernzelon dynasty. Its capture, without a fight, was a grave impingement on their authority. Though home to the centre of Prussian administration at the Charlottenburg Palace and the royal residence at Sanssouci, the true prize, as far as Napoleon was concerned, was the mausoleum commemorating the previous Prussian king, Frederick II de Grosse. Napoleon's aide-de-camp and friend, Philippe Paul de Ségur, recorded that the emperor's usual intensity dissipated. Instead, as he entered the mausoleum and viewed Frederick's tomb, he insisted upon utter quiet. Quote, Remove your hats, gentlemen, he said to his entourage. Were this man still alive, I would not be here. Ten minutes of silent contemplation followed. The no doubt deep respect Napoleon had for Friedrich's abilities did not extend to his personal property. Friedrich's sword, sash, battle standards, flags, and even his alarm clock were confiscated and dispatched to France. The sword and sash were to be sent to Les Invalides. The little golden alarm clock, meanwhile, remained at Napoleon's bedside for the rest of his life. Friedrich's flute, a fairly unassuming black instrument, was left at Sans Souci. Perhaps Napoleon could see propaganda use for captured military paraphernalia, perhaps he needed a well made clock. But an instrument was too personal a thing to disturb, and so it remained in the mausoleum. As French troops completed the occupation of Berlin, Napoleon took up residence at the Charlottenburg Palace on October 25th. Keeping one eye on the army, 
with the other Napoleon supervised the occupation of the Prussian capital. Back in September, the Berliners themselves had been gripped with fervor at the news of war with France. The same Prussian soldiers who had fled from Jena and Auerstedt had, only weeks before, paraded through Berlin to the adoration of the crowds. It was therefore essential not to provoke the Berliners. Shock played to Napoleon's advantage here. News in Saxony was spotty, and by the time many in Berlin knew that the Prussian army was kaput, French troops were already in Spandau and Potsdam. Even as they passed, satirical posters of Napoleon still hung on shop windows and tavern doors. There was to be no looting, no repression, and indeed, aside from a de facto curfew imposed by the French, life was merely on pause in Berlin. Harsh punishments, up to and including execution, were instead reserved for any French soldier found guilty of looting or assault. On the 26th, La Grande Armée met its victory march through Berlin. Bavou's corps was afforded the honour of leading the procession for their triumph at Auerstedt. Starting at the Charlottenburg, the French troops paraded down the wide avenues of central Berlin, through the Tiergarten and under the Brandenburg Gate. Berliners watched on in near silence, the symbolism not lost on anyone. Indeed, the symbolism was the entire point. The route deliberately plotted to pass underneath the Brandenburg Gate, a monument to a successful Prussian intervention into the United Provinces in 1787. Napoleon capped off the triumphal march under the gate with an address to Davout's corps, which was then later reprinted in the army bulletin. To la Grande Armée We have reached Potsdam and Berlin even before word could arrive of your victories. We have captured 60,000 prisoners, 65 flags, including those of the Prussian Royal Guard, 6,000 cannon, three fortresses, and 20 generals. And yet, more than half of you can complain of having had no opportunity to fire a shot. Soldiers, the Russians boast that they are marching against us. We shall spare them half a journey and march out to meet them. There we will give them another Austerlitz fought in the heart of Prussia. Over the next few days, more triumphal military parades followed each more grandiose than the last. On the 27th, 20,000 grenadiers and cuirassiers of the Imperial Guard and Reserve Cavalry retraced the steps of Davout's corps from the day before. Polished breastplates and bright plumed shakos cut a marvellous sight. Napoleon rode with them, but ahead of the main procession, accompanied only by his staff. He was conspicuous for his lack of dress uniform, with one French officer later remarking that he was the worst dressed man there. The Berliners themselves seemed not to begrudge the victorious French too much. Their mood was a curious mix of despondency at so crushing a defeat, and curiosity at the soldiers and the emperor who had inflicted it upon them. There was even a brief moment of glee for the Berliners as the Prussian royal guard was paraded past as prisoners. Comprised of cocky sons of Junker lords, there was no love for the guard among the Berliners. They cheered as the guard was humiliated by being made to march past the French embassy, before whose steps they had sharpened their swords, goading France to war. Napoleon also gave the Berliners a chance to excise their complicity in the war, by implying that it was Queen Louise, not Friedrich Wilhelm, who had led Prussia astray. A bulletin from the 27th trotted out sexist tropes about women in positions of power that played well to contemporary beliefs. Not all of the Berliners were so enamoured by their French occupiers, however. On the 26th, Napoleon had accepted the keys to the city from Prince Franz Ludwig von Hatzfeld. It turned out that the prince had been writing coded letters to Prince Hörnler containing details on French strength. Napoleon was furious, and had it not been for the intercession of his staff, namely Armand Augustin Coudencourt and Louis-Alexandre Berthier, Hatzfeld might well have found himself put up against a wall and shot. Instead, the next day, this episode was played to Napoleon's advantage, as Hatzfeld's wife, Frederica, was invited to the Charlottenburg, where she pled for her husband to be spared. Napoleon agreed, making damned sure that the news of his clemency was spread all throughout Berlin. Less publicised was the pilfering of Berlin's historical artefacts. Apart from the paraphernalia of Frederick the Great, Napoleon ordered the quadriga of winged victory atop the Brandenburg Gate to be taken down and carted off to Paris. 
Then the needle monument erected at the battlefield of Rosbach was demolished and also taken away. Back home, these symbolic acts would maximise the propaganda victory of Jena and Auerstedt. There were still plenty of very real victories yet to come too. With Berlin captured, any hope of Prussia regrouping to mount a proper defence was over. It only remained to mop up the last pockets of resistance. Hernlow's plan was to escape up the Oder to Stettin, but in his wake were the cause of Lannes, Bernadotte and Marat, racing northwards out of Berlin. Oranienburg quickly fell to the advancing French infantry, while the cavalry made haste for Prenzlau. There on the 28th, Marat found Hernlow's army, or rather what was left of it. Without any ammunition or food, there was no fight left in the Prussians. Hernler quickly submitted to Marat's demands for surrender under the mistaken belief that over 100,000 French troops surrounded Prenzlau. 10,000 infantry and 64 guns were captured. Only the 4,000 Prussian cavalry escaped, but they too were quickly apprehended at Passavalk on October 29th. Having expected Hernler to heave into sight any minute, Stettin was instead greeted by Antoine Lassalle at the head of 700 Hussars. He quickly secured the surrender of Stettin's city. Seeing this, the fortress commander agreed to surrender too, even ferrying Lasalle's squadrons over the Oder to take the arms of over 5,000 surrendering Prussians. Stettin's immediate capitulation was just a symptom of Prussia's utterly broken spirit. Perhaps the only man left in Prussia who still believed in victory was General Blücher. By November 5th, he'd only barely evaded Bernadotte and Saul's corps to take refuge in Lübeck. The French were mere hours behind, and though exhausted, surrounded the port city. In charge of 22,000 bedraggled soldiers, Blücher's hope now was to leverage Lübeck and neutrality in the hope that the Royal Navy would evacuate its entire force to Britain. It was a fanciful hope. Lübeck's neutrality meant nothing to the French. Bernadotte and Soule jointly attacked the city. General Scharnhorst took command of the defence with 10,000 men, while Blücher made good a retreat to nearby Ratkow with all the rest. Before nightfall on the 5th, Scharnhorst had surrendered. Though under pain of punishment, Soule's troops pillaged Lübeck, inflicting yet more devastation on the once proud centre of Baltic trade. Bernadotte was more successful in reining in his troops and set off after Blücher. Despite the old general's reputation for tenacity and grit, his situation was utterly helpless. Blücher wisely surrendered his army on November 6th. He received generous terms from Bernadotte, who was very eager to secure a quick conclusion. That's because from nearby Strassland, the Swedish army was on the move, no doubt to Blücher's aid. Rather than greet the approaching Swedish army with fire and steel, Bernadotte opened up cordial negotiations with the King of Sweden, Gustav IV. It was agreed that the Swedes would withdraw uncontested, and that the French would occupy Strasslund to prevent a British landing. In exchange, Bernadotte agreed to respect all Swedish property and law. Two days after the Swedish withdrawal, Magdeburg capitulated to Marshal Ney. The fortress had been one of the few to offer any real resistance, but its meagre stores of food and ammunition were quickly denuded by 22,000 demoralised Prussians. With the surrender of Magdeburg, there was not a single Prussian field army left west of the Elbe. Only in East Prussia were there any army units at all, mostly from the border forts, hastily assembled into a motley army of about 20,000. The military phase of the Thuringia campaign was now over. Napoleon had achieved his aim of defeating the Prussians militarily, but as Friedrich Wilhelm refused to accept terms of surrender, the war would continue. Prussian hopes now rested on Russian intervention. And that marks a natural point to pause our look at the War of the Fourth Coalition, so we can cover some of Napoleon's other pursuits. We're well across all the international and diplomatic developments throughout 1806, but not quite so for France's domestic situation, in particular the economic side of things. When Napoleon departed France in September 1805 to embark upon the Ulm campaign, he left France in the midst of a financial crisis. In broad strokes, the French banking system was buckling. It was bad enough that the investment economy had dried up after the collapse of Amiens, and all commercial enterprises were thwarted by the Royal Navy. France was then also facing down Russia and Austria in what would no doubt be a long and bloody war. Napoleon had already drained much of the treasury mobilising La Grande Armée for the unexecuted invasion of Britain. 
During that time, the army had been stationed in France, putting severe strain on local economies and resources. Economic prospects for the future appeared dim, so an expectation of lean times ahead, bank runs were common. This in turn forced the banks to demand a payment for the loans they'd given Napoleon's government, funds he simply didn't have. It was against the backdrop of this brewing crisis that the news of the capitulation of Ulm reached Paris. The stunning victory restored public faith in the government and thereby the banks. A few weeks later, when Napoleon scored another stunning victory at Austerlitz, the worst of the crisis dissipated. But that didn't mean that the underlying economic conditions contributing to the crisis had gone anywhere. France was still under economic embargo from Britain. Domestic industry was reeling from undercapitalization and the army still demanded colossal sums of money. Returning to Paris in January 1806, financial matters dominated Napoleon's Cousin meetings. Fortunately, he was lucky enough to have two very capable financial minds at his service. Charles Goudin, a very adroit minister, ran the Ministry of Finance like clockwork. He worked hand in glove with Francois Barbemois-Bois, the Minister of the Treasury. Both had undertaken long-term financial reforms since their appointments. These reforms even predating Napoleon becoming first consul, let alone emperor. Political expedient compelled Napoleon to fire Barbe Marbois in January 1806 as a scapegoat for the recent financial woes. Charles Molliard took his place in the treasury. Established in January 1800 to replace the directory's hopelessly corrupt version, La Direction Générale du Trésor, the General Directory of the Treasury, was answerable directly to the Ministry of Finance. The Treasury asserted rigorous financial oversight over all aspects of state expenditure and revenue raising. They also kept highly detailed accounts and investigated reports of corruption with thorough audits. By 1806, the Treasury was in prime condition at just the right moment. When Napoleon returned from the Austerlitz campaign, he was flush with about 75 million francs, which had been obtained, fairly or otherwise, over the course of the previous year's campaign as contributions from allies, bounty from occupied lands, and reparations from Austria. Deducting the army's expenses still left a solid 50 million francs for the banks, though this sum still fell short of what was owed. Taxes would have to make up the shortfall, and that was where the Treasury and the Ministry of Finance stepped in. Knowing chapter and verse the saga of political and financial worries that had toppled the Ancien Régime, Napoleon was reluctant to introduce any new taxes, lest his support be undermined. So instead, Charles Goudin opted to overhaul the existing tax system by making it more efficient. Godard had begun this difficult work years ago. In November 1799, the Directory's inadequate system was replaced by a new system overseen directly by the Ministry of Finance. In every department of France was established a Direction du Recouvrement des Impositions Directes, a directorate for the recovery of direct taxes. Accountants provided by the Treasury staffed the directorates, each of which was supervised by an Inspector General. The Inspector General reported to the Receiver General, who in turn reported directly to the Ministry of Finance. Roughly three quarters of tax revenues were to be forwarded monthly to Paris, though after 1806 this occurred every 10 days. There were three main sources of direct tax revenue upon which the French Empire relied. The first was a straight land tax called la contribution foncière. A product of the French Revolution, the land tax was levied on rural landowners. When introduced in 1791, the land tax raked in 240 million francs, though this sum came disproportionately from small freeholders and peasant families. Reforms in 1803 and 1804 significantly reduced this sum to around 200 million francs based on more accurate census data and revised estimates of what was owed. So though the value was down, the tax was far more equitably distributed between major landowners and minor landowners. Another revolutionary era tax on incomes was also maintained, but not with the same success as the land tax. La contribution personnelle mobilière was chiefly levied on towns and cities and targeted personal incomes. What counted as an income varied and year on year chopped and changed. Barely worth the effort anymore, by February 1804 the income tax was phased out entirely. The steadily decreasing value of direct taxes forced the Ministry of Finance to rely heavily upon indirect taxes. Excise duties on luxury commodities like tobacco and alcohol were the mainstay of indirect taxation, and they recalled nothing so much as the despised octroi of the Ancien Régime. Though the Empire referred to the duties officially as rayonnis, 
they were colloquially still called Octois. Despite their controversiality, the Octois were expanded in 1806 to include commodities like salt and even public transport or the playing of cards. Though hated by all, the Octois were indispensable to the state. Between 1806 and 1812, when the value of direct taxes hovered around 200 to 250 million francs per year, the increased applicability of the Octois increased their value by four times as much to around 1,000 million francs. In the short term, in 1806, state expenses for the year were around 700 million francs, leaving 300 million as income. Nonetheless, the public debt was still significant, made all the worse by the near collapse of the Bank of France in late 1805. Speculating in shares on South American investments, the Bank of France very nearly went under when the bubble burst. Had the bank gone under, it would have been a complete disaster for state finances, as not only was the Bank of France handling the state's public debt, but was also the main investment bank for the commercial and political elite. Napoleon had the older leadership evicted, along with Balbert Moabois, as we saw, and replaced by a bunch who wouldn't pursue bank-oriented private investments, but rather focus more closely on supporting state financial ventures. The most important change here was the bank's right to issue state bonds at 6% interest per annum, providing another source of constant state revenue. With all this money now flowing into the French economy, whether from national revenues, war reparations, or captured loot, inflation was beginning to rear its head. Fortunately, measures implemented during Napoleon's consulship prevented the issue from ever becoming serious. Having inherited a jumbled mess of metal coinage and paper money, in 1803 the Ministry of Finance imposed order by re-adopting metal coinage fixed to a silver standard. Available in copper, silver and gold, all at ascending denominations, the rollout of the imperial silver franc was remarkably successful. The stability of the currency made it very popular in France, where it quickly displaced the old nearly worthless royal and revolutionary currencies. There was even some success in imposing adoption in certain French-facing regions in Italy, Switzerland and Germany. The result was that France enjoyed a very stable common currency, used not only in its domestic market but also in neighbouring markets. Only the British pound sterling could compete, and though constantly devalued by increasing inflation throughout the Napoleonic Wars, the pound did still outstrip the franc as the currency of European commerce. Most of these varied reforms were bundled up and passed by March 1806 as a package. France was now entirely out of the woods as regarded financial worries, and as we've seen were going from strength to strength. So with short-term pressure relieved, Napoleon could recommit to longer-term planning and his true passion project. In order to strengthen the power of the French Empire, Napoleon turned towards a project of empire building, the consequences of which were to have profound continent-spanning implications. In this new Grand Empire, or Great Empire, nothing was to atrophy or be left to chance. Reforms at all levels were to assert both the power of the empire at home and secure its interests abroad. As we've seen, Napoleon was quick to sponsor and engage in major reform projects, which we've covered in detail already. This includes everything from the Coeur de Napoleon to the Coeur d'Armée system. All these diplomatic, social, political, financial and legal endeavours fit into the larger scope of the Grand Empire, forming the pillars upon which Napoleon's empire rested. In 1806, the only pillar Napoleon lacked for was economic. Despite France's improved fiscal position and success on the battlefield, the nation was still one disaster, whether financial or military, away from economic ruin. Indeed, ironically enough, France's military success was at the heart of this problem. Building and maintaining large armies is tough, a problem that the Committee of Public Safety understood all too well during the Revolutionary Wars. With the French economy in dire straits, the only effective remedy for French armies was to not fight directly in the defence of France, but rather engage the enemy on their own turf, to make war pay for war. Invasions of Catalonia, Piedmont, the Rhineland and the Low Countries subsidised the cost of the army whilst also filling French coffers with thousands of tonnes of loot which offset against the cost of war. This economic pressure to go on the offensive had never disappeared even after France prevailed in the Revolutionary Wars. Similar concerns presaged Napoleon's 1800 invasion of Italy, and more recently in 1805 and 1806, the decision to invade Germany. This cycle of military success fueling economic success exerted profound influence on the shaping of the French Empire. But it was a double-edged sword, 
as we will see by the time the Empire's successes are turned to defeats. For now in 1806, Napoleon's career is still one of mostly uninterrupted military success, which has brought great wealth and prosperity to France. However, the cycle is beginning to slow. Germany is all but conquered or allied to France. Holland, Switzerland, Italy and Naples are all client states. And of course, with Austria thrice defeated, and now bound by treaty to a truce and alliance with France, Napoleon can't simply visit the Bank of Vienna to withdraw more millions in reparations. Now, it's not as though these client states and allies don't contribute both directly and indirectly to the French economy. Every German, Swiss, Italian or Dutch battalion at arms is a battalion the French don't have to fund, and heavy demands are placed on the client states for their money and supplies. Though very valuable, these contributions are still not the same as invading and simply extracting raw resources or demanding reparations. There's also the issue really setting in here in 1806 that maintaining the whole French Empire is far more expensive than merely defending the territory of France. The size of La Grande Armée at its foundation in 1804 was around 200,000 soldiers. In 1806, that number has doubled to 400,000. When factoring in two the cost of regenerating losses and the raising of new units, it becomes understandable why Napoleon was so demanding of his allies and client states. Without a strong enough economic base in France alone, he had to extract everything he could in order to make the cost of empire sustainable. So what was to be done? How could Napoleon settle France on more firm economic fundamentals? Well, the aim here was to transition France away from the need to extract resources from Europe and instead become the economic and commercial centre of a new French-dominated European market. And that meant excluding Great Britain entirely from European trade. For the past 50, 60 years, Britain had dominated European trade and commerce. Britain of the 18th century was an economic powerhouse, confirmed in that position by defeating their only serious rival France in the Seven Years' War. An unbroken supply chain linked to Europe to the rest of the world via Britain, whose merchant marine, whose financial and banking system, whose navy was at the centre of a truly international market. The upside of Britain's dominance of world trade was not just bonanza income, but intensive economic growth in Britain itself. Not rich in the raw resources needed for their own economy, Britain sourced goods like timber, grain, metals and cotton from both Europe and American trading partners, and also from their own expansive empire. Manufactories sprung up across Britain to convert these raw resources into refined products to be sold on. Generally speaking, British goods were not the highest quality. What they were was cheap and affordable at a decent enough quality. So while French clothing, Austrian furniture or Italian wine were traded as luxury goods, Britain churned out in bulk common goods like shoes, clothes and tools for mass consumption. Local European manufacturing did of course exist, and Prussia, Austria, France or the big boys did have their own well-developed domestic markets for common goods. But in smaller states, especially littoral states, local industry simply never needed to develop very far, as British goods were both cheap and readily available. This is all to make no mention of the trade of colonial products like tobacco, sugar and tea, on which Britain had an effective monopoly. The limiting factor for Britain was a connection to oceanic trade. It was through European ports that the goods flowed, and so they needed access to these ports. For decades, this hadn't been a problem. France could raise tariffs, implement mercantilist policies, or even try to interdict British trade at times of war. It didn't really matter much because there was always someone else who needed what Britain was selling. This dynamic, however, was gradually inverting. Britain really was beginning to feel the pinch of two decades of French domination of the European continent. In particular, French domination of the Netherlands. As the de facto entrepôt for British goods into Central Europe, ports like Den Haag, Antwerp and Amsterdam were essential to British interests. Where the loss of major trading ports in Europe hurt the British, it wasn't too bad for the French. Already France had suffered through the effects of being severed from international trade. Apart from the brief peace of Amiens, French flagged ships were fair game for the roving Royal Navy. Britain, in fact, had re-upped their blockade with a ban on all French or French aligned shipping in May 1806. Suffering in proportion were the major French trading ports like Bordeaux, Nantes and Marseille. Even before the Napoleonic Wars, the loss of French colonial possessions had curtailed international commerce. The effect was that by 1806, France had been effectively weaned off of international trade. Sure, it'd be nice to have, 
but not a lifeline like it was for Britain. Agriculture was still the mainstay of the domestic French economy, and while French industry produced goods that in better times might have been sold internationally, they could just as readily be carted over land to European trading partners. The dynamic was such that as France expanded, conquering land and forging new alliances, Britain had fewer and fewer European buyers for their finished goods. Napoleon viewed Britain as, quote, a nation of shopkeepers. He viewed their reliance on trade as an Achilles heel and had done for a long time. Napoleon's Egyptian campaign had been justified on how it would harm British trade into Asia, after all. The near total dominion the Royal Navy enjoyed on the high seas prevented Napoleon from considering any similar long-ranged attacks on the British Empire. But what he could do was close out the end market for British goods in Europe. Napoleon envisioned a continental blockade of British exports. From Sanssouci, the Emperor promulgated the Berlin Decrees of November 6, 1806. The decrees began by citing the various real and imagined transgressions of the British, which invoked, quote, the first stages of barbarism. After this came 11 articles which detailed the scope of the continental blockade. The British Isles were to be declared in a state of blockade, severed from commercial contact with France, their client states, allies and Spain. British subjects on the continent were to be made prisoners of war, along with any goods taken from British warehouses. These confiscated goods would then be sold off with half the profits given to the merchants whose ships and wares had been seized by the Royal Navy. For all the significance attached to the continental blockade, both then and now, it was effectively only confirming a status quo that had existed since the breaking of Amiens, in which the British did not and could not trade in French-aligned ports. But there's no doubt, however, that Napoleon had grander plans for the blockade than a mere embargo. Trade with the continent made up about a third of Britain's trade by volume, so by cutting off access, Napoleon could inflict serious economic pain on his implacable enemy. The continental blockade therefore became more effective if it applied to more ports, thereby providing Britain fewer and fewer ports of call. Beyond the areas he already controlled or influenced, Napoleon intended to expand the blockade out to include neutral nations. For instance, at the Treaty of Schönbrunn, one of the many demands placed on Austria was that they cease commercial contact with Britain. Here in 1806, the same demands were made of Friedrich Wilhelm, contributing to his decision to continue his hopeless war. And did the expansion of the continental blockade will from here on out be the driving force of Napoleon's foreign policy, since if even a single state keeps its ports open to Britain, British goods will flood in and undermine the whole project. That being said, the blockade, as initially implemented, did not aim to entirely exclude the British. In fact, trade with Britain was to be encouraged if all they did was import raw resources from Europe back to Britain to be paid for in specie. Napoleon's logic was that if Britain still imported raw resources to then be converted to goods, but couldn't offload these goods to Europe, then the money spent would quickly dry up. This in turn would force the British government to make tough decisions to prevent rampant inflation, either taking more massive loans, printing more money, or in extremis, devaluing the pound sterling. With the French Navy at the bottom of the sea, or otherwise confined to port, the continental blockade was the only way Napoleon could realistically strike out at Britain. As he confided to Louis, quote, I intend to conquer the sea through the power of the land. So if the conquest of the sea was the blockade, then what was the power of the land? Alone the continental blockade was not conquest, so much as area denial. However, this did make the space in which France could harness and build a strong economic base by leveraging near total dominance of continental Europe. Napoleon termed this project the Continental System. Extending the underlying Colbarian, mercantilist logic of the Continental Blockade, Napoleon aimed to monopolize internal European trade by being the sole major producer of completed staple goods, the exact goods Britain specialized in. Already the French economy was self-sufficient, being as it was largely agricultural. Industrial and commercial concerns had recovered and now sought new markets with which to trade. Leveraging France's industrial and agricultural heft, Napoleon now aimed to compel other European states to view France as their major trading partner, creating for France a captive audience. This was not, however, to be a European common market, where all trading partners were essentially on the same legal and commercial level. 
With economic and diplomatic pressure, Napoleon intended to impose disadvantageous deals on European states that would see the French buy low and sell high. Without competition and backed by the French military, France would dominate a European market in which prices on their goods remained artificially high. All of this was great news for French industry and manufacturing, which from 1806 to 1810 would grow in leaps and bounds. The influx of cheap cotton from the Ottoman Empire and wool from Italy and Germany propelled a spike in textile manufacturing. The army especially was a major buyer of textiles as they required everything from cheap woolen coats for the infantry to the finest quality textiles for officers and prestige units. Though production remained mostly artisanal, large-scale industrialization did occur. British technology such as the spinning jenny had either been imported or quite often copied during the Peace of Amiens. Now in 1806, the Jennies were in full swing. Textile work sprung up all across France and its surrounds, in Paris, Lyon, Passy, Hent, and the Eure. Industrial development synergized with scientific advancements, and indeed Napoleon's old friends at l'Académie Française, Antoine Lavoisier, Claude-Louis Bertholet, Jean-Antoine Chaptal, and many others, invented new techniques used across multiple industries. Nowhere was this more apparent than in the production of soda ash, which was vital not only in the production of textiles, but also in the industrial manufacturing of soap, glass, and paper. Nicolas Leblanc's Leblanc process, invented only about 10 years before, allowed French chemical industry to expand rapidly, with Parisian soda works outputting a vast majority of Europe's soda ash. In the iron smelting industry, Napoleon's policy of ralliement and sponsorship of l'Académie saw confluence of industrial and scientific interest that drastically increased iron and steel output. Returning émigrés restarted production at Le Crosset and Ayage Ironworks, largely to forge cannon. This in turn led them to cooperate with scientists who implemented the coke furnace in France for the first time. Ancillary industries too, like in coal extraction and charcoal burning, benefited as well. For all the myriad economic benefits France accrued from the continental system, the fact remained that it was a system that had to be imposed administratively and diplomatically upon largely unwilling participants. Very deliberately, the system was meant to benefit France first and foremost, and were it not for French military dominance, it's hard to imagine that any state would willingly submit itself to total economic subservience. The artificiality of the continental system, therefore, was its greatest weakness, as there was no natural basis for it outside of purely French economic interest. By 1810, the contrived nature of the system would fatally undermine it, but for now, in November 1806, the Berlin Decrees went into effect without a hitch. And that brings us back around neatly to Berlin, to Napoleon, and the War of the Fourth Coalition. After establishing a strong east-facing defence to protect Brandenburg, French operations were on a de facto strategic pause now that all Prussian forces west of Berlin had been decisively crushed. It was good timing all things considered. The month of November had arrived with an unseasonable chill. Caught in limbo between peace and war, and now assailed by the cold, the army's willingness to carry on was in doubt. Similar concerns were being raised by Charles-Maurice de Talleyrand, now in Berlin advising Napoleon directly. He conveyed that the exuberant mood that had swept France after the dual victories of Jena and Auerstedt had faded, replaced by that all-too-familiar pessimism that preceded a long war. The longer the war dragged on, the further Napoleon's legitimacy was undermined. A seasoned politician, Napoleon did understand this problem at an instinctive level, even if it frustrated him to no end. Had he not offered peace to Friedrich Wilhelm on decent terms, if anyone was to blame for ongoing hostilities, it was the King of Prussia. Outbursts and arguments were common within the halls of the Charlottenburg, as Napoleon and Talleyrand went back and forth. Emperor and minister had long held differing ideas on which direction France should take. What were once differences of opinion were further diverging into unbridgeable divides. As emperor, though, it's no surprise that Napoleon's ambitions for a Grand Empire one out of a Talleyrand shrewd pragmatism that saw France become a kind of primus into Paris. It was in this context that Napoleon promulgated the continental blockade on Britain, a move that Talleyrand opposed. He pointed out that Britain was, at this moment, primed for reconciliation. Prime Minister William Grenville's Ministry of All the Talents, a bipartisan Whig Tory government, had been formed back in February 1806 contending with worsening economic conditions at home, and thus flagging public support 
The ministry opted for an invasion of South America with the goal of opening new markets into which to offload goods which could no longer be easily sold in mainland Europe. The force under Holmes Riggs Popper, which had captured the Dutch Cape Colony in 1805, was now rerouted to the newly independent nation of the Republic of the Rio de la Plata. Buenos Aires fell after a short siege. Popham returned to Britain with news of the victory and his assurances that South America was right for the taking. Now, the upside for us is that Talleyrand was well aware of these developments. He was also well aware of the Ministry of All the Talents' muted reaction to the Prussian defeat, regarding it as all but inevitable. Indeed, with the lingering influence of Charles Fox still in the Whig party, there was even some excitement at the French victory over Prussia, always an unreliable ally. Elections were coming up in early 1807, and it seemed to Talleyrand that Britain was thoroughly preoccupied elsewhere, either trying to deal with serious domestic woes or devoting their military resources to colonial campaigns. It was then only with a greatest reluctance that Talleyrand agreed to back the blockade. We've now been over Napoleon's economic rationale for implementing the blockade and the continental system. Perhaps peace might be achieved with Britain following Talleyrand's plan, but it did nothing to cripple Britain in the long term. Napoleon was still determined to extend the bounds of French influence and therefore the continental blockade. With a lock on Western and Central Europe, the two areas of vital concern were in Eastern Europe and the Balkans. So Napoleon's attentions were focused squarely on his eastern borders. He had of course hoped that Prussia would have accepted his initial peace offerings, in which case they would have been fit into the Napoleonic Grand Empire as the eastern bulwark against Russia. However, Friedrich Wilhelm's intransigence suggested that this approach would not work. There was no way he'd be like Emperor Francis of Austria. For Friedrich to submit would mean to accept a peace that put him in conflict with Russia and made him a client king. So if Prussia could not serve as the empire's eastern bulwark, who would? The answer, as it turned out, had been there the entire time. La Grande Armée was already a very multinational force. There were Swiss regiments, Italian regiments from the Kingdom of Italy and Naples, and German regiments from the Confederation of the Rhine and allies in Baden, Bavaria and elsewhere. Making up a small but consistent contribution was Poland. Since the first days of the French Revolutionary Wars and then the Wars of the Coalition, France had benefited from a steady stream of Polish recruits. Patriotic Polish expatriates, expelled from Poland after 1794's rebellion, found a refuge in France, with many willing to take up arms. In 1797, the Polish legions were regularised in French and Italian service. Poles, and often as not Lithuanians, Hungarians, Czechs and Slovaks, taken as prisoners from the Austrian, Prussian and Russian armies, were offered freedom for service. The result was that by 1805, Napoleon had 27,000 to 30,000 Eastern European soldiers in his army. Most of this number was made up of Poles, which is a truly impressive feat since Poland had not been an independent state since the third partition of the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth in 1795. Many Poles, proud of their novel Commonwealth, fought hard to keep their independence and then revolted against foreign rule. Polish revolutionaries like Tadeusz Kosciuszko, Henryk Dabrowski and Prince Józef Pontianowski launched a rebellion in 1794. It was crushed ruthlessly by Marshal Suvorov of the Russian Empire. Afterwards, many Poles who had fought reconciled themselves to partition. Pontianowski, for example, was wooed by the Prussians and became a pliant subject even though he was once the heir to the whole of Poland. But the radicals would not surrender. They were the ones who fled west to France to form the basis of the Polish legions. Despite defeat and partition, the flicker of Polish nationhood was not snuffed out, even here in 1806. Independence was still the goal of the Polish expatriates, even if their composition had changed since 1794. The initial influx of Poles consisted of patriots whose revolutionary politics harmonised with those of the French Revolution. Of course, as France descended further into authoritarianism and then in 1804 did away with the Republic entirely to become an empire, many Poles were disillusioned. They no longer saw France as a kindred nation, but a more traditional ally, and more specifically, a vehicle with which to achieve Polish nationhood. This endpoint came clearly into focus the further Napoleon pushed into Germany. The Emperor was under a lot of pressure from Poles within the army to lay out a plan for Polish independence. Henryk Dabrowski was the most strident of these voices, and offered numerous ideas as to how to achieve this end, even if they fell on deaf ears. Napoleon was, as was universal amongst the French elite, overtly sympathetic to the Polish cause. 
In private, however, he placed little stock in Poland and so refused to adopt Polish independence as a policy position for the longest time. Simply put, he was not willing to imperil relations with Prussia, Austria and Russia in times of peace by endorsing the partial dismemberment of their territories. And even when France was at war with these powers, Polish independence was off the table so that Napoleon would not have to make the hard sell for a Polish nation. Even if he did, it was hard for him to see how a free Poland was all that helpful. No doubt Poland would be an ally after the peace was signed, but an effective one not so much. The Polish legions would return to defend a homeland that was surrounded on all sides by enemies, eager to reconquer their lost Polish claims, and no doubt France would be drawn into this war too. What began to tip the balance, however, and start to chip away Napoleon's hesitance, was manpower shortfall in the main French army. He had already called up the class of 1806 a year early, meaning that he was effectively borrowing soldiers from the future. With peace nowhere in sight, the manpower situation could turn dire quickly. An independent Poland could be the answer to this problem. A friendly, populous nation that was already opposed to France's enemies and integrated into the French army could provide an untapped source of recruits. What's more, now that France actually did mostly border Poland, direct military support was not the issue it once was. With one ally in his back pocket, Napoleon moved quickly to make a second in Selim III, Sultan of the Ottoman Empire. Relations between France and the Ottoman Empire had mellowed since the Egyptian campaign, largely because they shared enemies in Austria and Russia. After the Battle of Austerlitz, Napoleon had turned on the charms, and through his ambassadors to Istanbul, Horaz Sebastiani and Guillaume Bonn, gradually chipped away at Ottoman neutrality. Though inclined to be standoffish, Selim's apt calculation was that Russia, expansionistic and zealous, was an existential threat far more imposing than France. Napoleon had conquered Istria and Dalmatia and promised to compensate Austria with Ottoman territory, but these threats were far less immediate than Russia's very direct claims on the eastern Mediterranean and the Balkans. An alliance of convenience formed. Selim broke his treaty of friendship with the Russians in 1798 to side with France. Russian shipping was blocked through the Dardanelles, and Napoleon even recognised as Padishah. In return, Selim was given carte blanche to act as he pleased in the Balkans. In the main, that meant reasserting Ottoman authority. Serbia was in revolt, the Greeks were agitating for independence, but worst of all, Wallachia and Moldavia were straying from the Turkish orbit. The Eastern Orthodox rulers of Wallachia and Moldavia, Konstantin Ypsilanti and Simon Moruzi, respectively, though nominally the subjects of Selim, took their cues instead from Russia. This system was formalised in 1802 with a concordat between the Ottomans and Russia, in which the Ottomans remained the lords of Wallachia and Moldavia, but the Russians chose their rulers. This state of affairs was broken in August 1806, when Selim deposed Russia's chosen rulers. Yet another Russo-Turkish war loomed. Russia was only prevented from immediately invading by France's lightning-fast Turingia campaign. Tsar Alexander expected to be sipping tea in Istanbul that November. Instead, his army was gathering in Poland ready to defend against Napoleon's anticipated eastward punch. And that punch was well in the making. On November 2nd, the first French troops had marched from Brandenburg to Posen to take up advanced positions east of Berlin. In doing so, La Grande Armée had crossed the ancient border from Germany into Poland. In search of military and economic support, Emperor Napoleon was now determined to see Poland return to the concert of powers as a client state. The fates of France and Poland were now tightly bound. With his newfound ally, Napoleon then hoped to claim the victory that had been denied to him by Friedrich Wilhelm in the aftermath of Jena and Auerstedt. And Napoleon not, after all, promised his army and Austerlitz out east. Leveraging the full might of the French Empire, the Emperor would assert his will over the Kingdom of Prussia and their Russian allies, pruning the thorns in his side with his most ambitious campaign yet.